in Jesus' most powerful name. Amen and amen. I want to say good evening to you and everybody watching me from all over the world tonight. I don't know about you, but I feel uh, a strong presence of the Holy Spirit tonight. The Lord is set to change lives tonight. And I hope you wouldn't take my words light tonight. I, I wish you wouldn't make light of my words tonight. I wish you would pay attention and really listen. Let he that has here, let him hear what the Spirit is saying tonight. For God is set to change lives. I'm speaking tonight about godliness. I'm speaking tonight about godliness. In the beginning when God created man, God had a plan. And he created this man to carry out his plan. And because God is king, his plan is to reign and to rule and to unify everything under one government. Everything in all the realms of his dominion, he intends to unify them under one government. At the time that God created man, the first man, Adam, the earth were already out of course. Darkness was upon, it, was upon the face of the earth. And God created this man, this functionary by which God will restore order to the realms of the earth. And so God created a template of order in the garden. And he placed the man he made right at the center of an ordered environment. And the intention of God is that the man will see the creation of God. The man will see the pattern in which God established the realms of his dominion and the man will duplicate and the man will continue to expand the influence of the garden until the earth is covered with the garden, until the earth is covered with order. And God wanted to reconcile all things back to himself. And before God could finish making the man, he fell. And so this fall of man was only an interference. It was not if it was not an end. It was only an interference because God will not give up until he gets for himself what he wants. And so from that moment up until when Jesus came, everything God had been doing were plans. He began to roll plans out and these plans were plans of restoration to restore what was, what was toppled, to restore what was, what was damaged. And so when Jesus was lifted up on the cross and he was crucified and he died, before he died he said it was finished. What was finished was not all that God wanted to do. What was finished was the works of restoration the price for restoration Jesus had finished pain and so he gave up the ghost and he died now what I want to speak to you tonight uh, is the reason why Jesus died what what next after Jesus died what what was to happen after he died so if you're saved and if you're born again, what was preached to you must have been the death and the resurrection of Jesus. How you were insane, how Jesus came and he died and he took your place and he became your substitute and he shed his precious blood and on the strength of his sacrifice you are saved because you put your faith in him. But that is not an end, that is only a means to an end. The end to which Jesus died is not just for you to believe that he died and he rose from the dead. The end to which he died is so that you can restore, but you can be restored back to the stature that the first man lost, so that we can then prosecute the intention of God should man not have fallen in the first place. Because if man did not fall, God had a plan, anyways. So when man fell, the, the ultimate plan of God was put on a hold. And God wrote out a plan of restitution, a plan to bring man back to where he fell from. Or better still, better than where he fell from. Because God was still working on the man that fell. 
And so they enter with Jesus died so that stature can be restored or that pathway to recovering stature was paved. The way it was paved. And then we were given the Holy Spirit. And the job of the Holy Spirit is to make us godly. The job of the Father, my Libra Astor, and Adabako Masaita, he got in the grand frame of reference of the existence of humanity. The Father was the creator. He was the one who created all that is to be. And the Son was the one who formed. He gave face. He gave rigor. He gave structure to everything that God created. And the job of the Holy Spirit was to make them good. His job was to make them fulfill the purpose for which you were created in the first place. And before the Holy Spirit could finish making Adam into the kind of ruler, the kind of king that God needed in the earth, he fell. And so Jesus died so that we can be readmitted back into the school of the Spirit where men are made. And the job of the Holy Spirit is to make us godly. Remember, we were created to be in the image and in the likeness of God. The job of the Holy Spirit is to conclude, is to wrap up this project in the in the in the laboratories of heaven it is to make out of us kings and priests so the Holy Spirit is the one who makes he is the one who makes he makes you into what is good Good meaning what is fit for purpose, the reason for which you were created in the first place. He is the one who makes you. He is the one who crowns. He is the one who puts crown on the creation of God. He is the one who makes it make sense. And remember the destination that we are journeying to is the destination called life. The one who, who channels that life through you is the Holy Spirit. He is life. Akakwata kupela dinamakosaila. He is the one who takes the cup of Christ so that the fullness of Christ can find expression in the sons of men. The Holy Ghost. So I'm speaking about godliness tonight. It is, it is, the, it is the work of the Holy Spirit in, in where he makes us like God. So is it possible for a born again Christian who have believed in Christ, who have been saved, Whose sin has been forgiven? Is it possible for them to live a life short of this kind of life? Yes. It is very possible. And how that is possible and what is accountable for that are one of the things that I'm going to be I'm, I'm, I'm talking on tonight. There is a life that Christ came to guarantee us. And that's what the Bible says in the book of in gospel according to St. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus speaking said, The devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus told us why he came. Just in case if you have ever wondered, why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? Now forget about what anybody said. Let's listen to what he says. Let's read it. Quickly, I didn't plan to read this tonight, but hey. We're already here, so let's just read it. John chapter 10, verse 10. Let's see what Jesus said. How he defined his coming. Why he came. John chapter 10, verse 10. He says, the, thief, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So you see, Jesus didn't just die so that you can just believe that he died. Okay? So he didn't just die to create an event that is worth believing in. Do you understand this? That is what most Christians have reduced the death and resurrection of Jesus to. It is just this fantastic, grand, overwhelming um, event. Jesus didn't come to just root emotion out of you. Just so that you feel bad that you were a sinner and, and, and someone who was very good came and he died for you. That couldn't be the end to which he came. 
Yes, that was part of what he did. Okay, that was that was part of how he paid the price, but the end to which he came. If you lose sight of that end, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ would have meant nothing to you. You would have reduced it to a tragic occurrence that 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 is worthy of an investment of pity and and sympathy. Jesus didn't die so that you pity him. Jesus didn't die so that we can have we can have pity on him. He didn't die so that we can feel or uh, we can we can have this emotional sorrowful feeling. No, that wasn't why he died. His death was pitiable. Yes. His death was painful. Yes. If you think about it, it is emotional. Yes, but was that why he died to create an emotional roller coaster? No. He came for a purpose, and the purpose is that you may have life. And not just any kind of life, an abundant life. Abundantly simply means increase without end. A limitless, a boundless life. A life that has no boundary, no circumstance, no circumference. A life that has no limit, no restraint. Life without limit, increase without end. This is abundance, and the word abundance is the fabric of God's kingdom. And out of, of his government and of his peace, there shall be no end. Unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And of the increase of this government and of its peace. And we know this government is the kingdom of God. The increase of the jurisdiction of this government and of its peace. <laughs> there will be no end. This is the definition of abundance. It is a life beyond limits. A life that cannot be contained. A life that cannot be stifled. A life that cannot be kept. A life that cannot be victimized. To this end, Jesus did all he did on the cross. And when he said it was finished, the price was fully paid. That you may have access to this life. But what you are not told is how to appropriate the, the sacrifice of Jesus. You just, you were told that the moment you believe in Christ and you confess him as your Lord and Savior, boom, you have this life. No! Because if it was true, then why are you still suffering? Why do you almost doubt if God is real sometimes when you take stock of your life compared to what the Bible says is possible? And then you begin to ask yourself serious questions like, am I was I scammed? Is Bible real? Are all these things true? Let me tell you something. If you if you break the sequence, if you do not give you if, if God want, when God wants to have mercy on you, what He gives you is light. He gives you understanding. And what the devil fights the most is, is light. He fights your understanding. He, he wants to make sure that you don't understand. He doesn't mind you getting knowledge. As long as the knowledge does not make it to the place of understanding. Because it is a journey. It starts as knowledge. The knowledge is interpreted and it becomes wisdom. And the wisdom is appropriated. Then it becomes understanding. The devil does not mind you getting knowledge. He just wants to make sure that it never becomes an understanding. Because when it becomes an understanding, that is when you get established. Understanding means establishment. Now you can't be moved. Now you cannot be shaken. Now nobody can talk you out of it. But as long as it remains knowledge, knowledge without interpretation is a burden. If you know how to be, if you if you've read in the book how to be rich and you don't know how to convert it from lines on the pages of the book to a reality, is a it's it's a burden. It would have been better for you not to know. The reason why Jesus came. Is for us to have a kind of life. Now the problem is the moment people get born again, they assume that they know how to live this life. So they just go right ahead. But the problem and the undoing is most often than not, or most of the time, you, you are still living your own life under a new identity. So your new identity now is Christian or a believer. But the problem is you don't even know the life of a believer. You don't know the life of a Christian. So you begin to live this life according to those who have been born again before you. What they say their life is. 
what they claim a life is. That becomes your standard and your definition of the life of Christ. But let me tell you, who teaches you the life of Christ is the Holy Spirit. And in the generation and time that we're living in, not many people have attended the school of the Spirit. So they just tell you whatever comes to their mind. They, 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 it is hearsay. They say what they heard someone say that someone said that someone say. The life that Jesus Christ died to afford you, the way that life is made available and that life is activated within you is that you are admitted into a school. It is called the school of the spirit. So that is why Jesus told his disciples, he says, do not go, even though I have called you apostles and I have given you an assignment, do not go until, until you receive the Holy Spirit. Do not go until the Holy Spirit comes. He is the one who will make sense out of everything that I've taught you. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life, but you don't know how to use this life. You don't even know the, the scope of this life. You don't know how to live this life yet. Yes, you saw me live it. But you see, you don't just learn by seeing in the kingdom. You learn by knowing. And the one who teaches, the one who causes your knowing, the one who facilitates knowing is the Holy Spirit. He furnishes the realities. Or he furnishes the word of God. He furnishes the realities of the word of God. He brings the reality. He converts knowledge into a reality. And it is by that reality, it is from the economy of that reality that we live the life of God. And so the disciples had knowledge. So many scriptures that they've known. Jesus came and he gave interpretation to many of those scriptures. He will quote, he will say, for this, this is what the scripture means. For the scripture says, he will quote Isaiah, he will quote Jeremiah. And Jesus will tell them today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears so they know they have heard the word. And Jesus was saying to his disciples when he said he needed to wash their, their legs, wash their feet. And Peter said, look, don't wash my feet. Don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And Peter said, oh yeah? Okay, then wash, wash my whole body. And Jesus replied, he said, the one who has had, a ba who has, who has had his bath does not need to wash his whole body again. He only needs to wash his feet. And he told them, he said, you are, being, you are clean because you have been washed by the water of the word. But it is not just good enough to be washed by the water of the word, meaning it is not just good to know. And by know here, I simply mean uh, um, to just receive knowledge. To just be told something. The point where what you are told begins to benefit you is when it becomes real to you. And the one who makes it real is the Holy Spirit. The life of the Spirit is what creates reality. Do you understand this? It is the life of the Spirit that makes that scripture that you have read become a reality. Ah, it is the God, I am the God that healed thee. You can read that scripture as a sick person and you can die sick. Reading that word does not mean you will partake of the goodness that will come from it until that word becomes real to you. And the one who takes it from just being a word into making it into a reality is the Holy Spirit. I have come that they may have life, a life abundantly. And you can read this life on the pages of the scripture all you like. It will never become your reality on the, until the spirit comes to furnish it. And the way the spirit does it is he admits you into a school. It is called a school of wisdom where it begins to teach you. It begins to teach you. It begins to lead and guide you into all truth. His job is to lead you and to guide you into all truth. Godliness. The intention of God is that we be like Him in every shape and form. And so Jesus came to pay the price so that the one who teaches, so that the one who can make, Malibra Adonomoko Silas, can make us. What I found in the church in the days that we're living in that people are not even taught about the Holy Spirit. Most average Christians don't even understand the Holy Spirit. So they don't even know how to harness and to benefit of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To them, he's just one of the names and he's just the third person in the Trinity. What does that even mean? 
So if I ask, if I, if I administer a question and I say, um, who is the Holy Spirit? What do you understand by the Holy Spirit? People will just say vague things like, yeah, he's the Spirit of God. He's the third person of the Trinity. He's the, he is the power of God. What does that even mean? And so people will go ahead and, 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 and they will say, oh, he's a person. He's a person. He's not just power. He's a person. But do you know this person? And when I say no, I don't mean have you heard about him? Listen, I know Lionel Messi because I've heard about him. I've watched him on the TV. But do I know him? No, I don't know him. I don't have a relationship with him. Do you know Bill Gates? Do I know Bill Gates? Yeah, I know him. I can identify him. If you show me pictures of people, I can point to him. Do I know what he has done? Yeah, I know he created Microsoft. I know he's heavily into philanthropy. I know, I know. But do I know him? No, I don't. Let me tell you the person that knows Bill Gates. His wife. His children. These people know him. There is a, there is a, they've shared a certain level of intimacy with him. They know him. They know his emotions. They know how he feels. They know when he's happy. They know when he's sad. You, I don't know when Bill Gates is happy or when he's sad. I don't know what he looks like when he's sleeping. I don't know his temperament when he wakes up. I don't know how he behaves when he's unhappy. You see, these things I don't know. But if you ask me, do you know Bill Gates? I will quickly respond and say yes. Now, so you understand that there are depths to knowing. So most people would say, I know the Holy Spirit. And if you ask them a question, who is the Holy Spirit? They would have something to say. But I'm putting it to you tonight that to know the Holy Spirit is not an head knowledge thing. It is not an information that we have been told uh, how, how um, he, he comes to church. He, he comes to our services. Uh, we feel the presence of the Holy Ghost now. That's, that's not knowing the Holy Spirit. All, so all you know are effects. Just like all I know about Bill Gates are the things that he does and the things that he has done and what he looks like and some things that some people who have heard about him have said. But you see, the intimacy and the knowledge that his wife shares with him is, is different from anything any of us would know. She knows she, there are contents of Bill Gates that is in his wife that even her voice cannot articulate. There is a level of knowing the Holy Spirit beyond what words can describe. It's almost like intercourse. It's almost like intimacy. It is when the deepest part of you mixes with the deepest part of you beyond where words can, can, can give expression. This is the pathway to life. Do you understand what I'm saying now? The life that Jesus came to afford you to make you godly. The way that becomes a reality is that you must know the person of the Holy Spirit and just not just know his name. Not just know that he is the thing that comes into the service. Not just know that he makes people fall down. Not just know that he heals the sick. Not just know that he raises the dead. Not just know that he gives wisdom. No, you must know him. Malibra experientially. You must partake. You must partake of his of his divine Malibra Adalabakumashalaba substance. It is in the place of communion that life is released into us to power our existence. It is then that we start living. You see, the abundant life that Jesus was talking about, it is a reality that is furnished by the Holy Spirit by which we live. It becomes a springboard. It becomes a launch pad by which we launch into this dimensionless life. When the Holy Spirit was preparing me for tonight, He gave me an analogy. He said, The Christians 
a believer, because one of the captions of tonight is a believer's life. Like Father, like us. A believer's life. And the Holy Spirit began to tell me, he said, Christians and believers in the earth are supposed to be the way that the world experiences God. Christians, you see when 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 what does it mean to be godly? To be godly simply means that you become a person that the salvation and everything that surrounds your life can be traced back to a source called God. I'll say that again. I'm just giving you a layman's, a simple definition. Okay? I don't want to be ambiguous tonight. I don't want to get you to begin to wander through a wilderness tonight. I want to bring you to an highway tonight. To be godly simply means everything about your life. The Bible says, by a fruit, a tree is known. It says, by their fruit, you will know them. A tree is known by its fruit. So also, if you are God's offspring, that means you are his fruit, isn't it? And God is supposed to be known by his fruit. In other words, your life, when someone comes in contact with your life, when you enter into the space of another person's life, when you enter into a community, when you enter into a group, when you enter into your workplace, when you enter into your circle of friends, when you enter and you when you bring your influence into the space of anybody's life, everything they feel, perceive, know, must be traceable back towards us. And that source must be God. That is what it means to be a godly person. It means the person begins to know and feel God even before they meet God because they have met you. You are so like God that it's almost accurate to, for someone to meet you and say, I met God today. Do you understand this? Now, when I say the word godly, it doesn't really sound strong and it doesn't really have much weight right now because I can guarantee you and I can say this with all boldness, there aren't many godly people in the time that we're living in. And that is why the knowledge of God and the experience of God is so alien that people can disrespect the concept of God, if you permit me to use that word. The reality of God is far from the fabric of civilization. So much so that when we measure the word God, it doesn't have no, there is no reverberation, there is no weight, there is no, there is no essence. It is so light and aka kwata kapalina makosaila. There is almost like it's almost like there is no glory. Because glory is weight. When you say the queen of England, there is, there is a certain sensitivity that it brings. When you say the police is coming, there is a certain fear and a certain consciousness that comes upon the people and people begin to look around. If I come to you and I say, oh, uh, by the way, if you hear the doorbell, say there are many people in the house and someone goes to answer the door and the person comes to you and say, oh, by the way, the police is outside looking for you. I immediately, there is a certain feeling. You begin to question yourself. What have I done? What happened? Why is the police there? Even if you have not committed a crime, the fact that you hear that the police is at the door, there is a certain respect, a certain glory that has been accorded to the police force that you begin to, it immediately begins to condition your, your, your temperament, your countenance. If you hear that belief is at the door, there is a certain kind of fear because of the stature and the establishment, the understanding and the reality that you know that these people called belief can furnish, they can, they can, they can take your stuff. You could be a classmate with someone. You could be a work colleague with someone. And then all of a sudden, a news came out and you heard that they are, they, they, this person 
it has been found out that this person is a serial killer. And then you're going to work the following day. And they said, look, we don't want to arrest them yet. Okay, we're still building up the case. But 80%, we know that there is, there is serial, this guy is a serial killer. And this person sits next to you at work. I can guarantee you, when you get to work the next day, you will, you will, you wouldn't, and say, if, if you're going to the toilet, and if this person says, yeah, I'm going to the toilet, you, you wait, you're not going to go to the toilet. You don't want to go into the toilet with a serial killer. Why? Because there is an understanding that you have about serial killer and this understanding has been made real and strong by occurrences that have happened, news and, and the realities that he has published, the obituaries of men that has been announced, killed by this lawless serial killers. If you have a neighbor and all of a sudden you see a headline that this guy is wanted because he participated in a terrorist attack and the one that happened eight years ago, the one that happened five years ago, and you happen to know that this guy is your neighbor. And say you've been hearing some fireworks. And in your mind you say, oh, it's just because it's Christmas. Let me tell you something. After you find out that this guy is a terrorist, if you hear fireworks the following day, you're not just going to assume that it's fireworks. You will be checking to be sure. Because now you know it is because there is an expectation. There is, there is an understanding that has now entered you about the reality that this person is, is able to furnish. This person is able to set a place ablaze. And they have done it. And it has been proven. And so to you now, terrorism is not just another thing. It is real. Do you understand this? Some people can say, oh, we don't care about the coronavirus. It is just scaremongering. They're just scaremongering people. They're just trying to put fear in people. Now, you can say that. And most often than not, the people saying that have not been down with coronavirus. You say that beside the family of someone who lost two people. I heard there was a child that lost both parents to coronavirus. You go say beside that child that this thing is just a joke, it doesn't mean anything. The child will curse you from her heart. Because this same thing you're calling nothing has cost this child. This child will be an orphan for the rest of their life. Because of the same thing you're making light of. So I'm saying, the reason why when you hear God in our society today, when you hear the name Jesus in our society today, it seems not to carry any weight. Why? Because there aren't many people whose life express the reality of this God. And this is the reason why Jesus came. He came so that you can have a life, a kind of life that when men experience it, it is as though they have experienced God. This is what it means to be godly. So you ask yourself, since the day you become born again, do people, do people see you and they a an awe of God comes upon them? Do people see you and they start feeling like they need to repent of sin? Do people see you and they say, mm, I notice that when I'm close to you, I find it hard to sin. But when I move far away from you, it's easier to sin. Do you, do you, that does an influence like that touch people that come in close proximity to you? That is what it means to be godly. Until then, I don't care how much money you have. Until you have an influence that causes people to gravitate towards God in whatever shape or form. You're not godly. And Jesus died. The Holy Spirit was given. He died so that the Holy Spirit can be given. And the Holy Spirit was given so that He can furnish in us the life that Jesus died to afford us. There are so many things that are fighting you. 
to make sure that your life never express the life of God. So being a Christian is not a big deal to the devil. He doesn't care. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't change anything. Doesn't put a dent on anything. In fact, what has been made out of Christianity is mockery. So that those who are even Christians are not bold to say they are Christians when they get into certain circles, you pocket your Christianity. And you quickly identify and associate with unbelievers. And say, yeah, I know I'm a believer, I know I'm saved, you know, but we, we need to preach the gospel to these people, so we need to be like them. No. No. That wasn't what Apostle Paul meant. <laughs> you pocket your holiness. No. So, my first conclusion tonight is the essence of the death and resurrection of Jesus. The reason why he was dispatched from heaven. The reason why a body was prepared for him and his spirit, Malibra Andrews, was converted to the seed of man, sent into the earth realm and planted into the womb of a virgin and he was born and he was subjected to everything that men could go through so that he could be qualified to die and to ransom us. The end to which he did all of this thing is so that we can partake of a kind of life. And the one who furnishes, the one who appropriates the price or the benefit of what Jesus paid is still price for. The one who appropriates that benefit into our life. And our life is actively under the influence and portrays the essence and the weight of this life. That personality is the Holy Spirit. And until you engage and interface and experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you cannot live this life. You will only talk about it. You will only hear about it. And until a generation comes, and that generation is now, where men really begin to return to looking like God and becoming like God and acting and functioning and speaking like God. Because when God speaks, creation happens. Let there be light and there was light until men are able to speak again and creation begins to happen because the only species of creation that God gave the life, giving power is the man, the son of man. And so the ones who wield the power of dominion in Israel are those who will rule like God. Not men who will create things after their own desires, but men who will become as God designed for them to be. <sighs> the life of the Spirit. This is the godly life. Let's look at scriptures tonight. Let's look at scriptures tonight and then we'll call it a day. I believe you're getting blessed already. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. So I was telling you about that one analogy that the Holy Spirit told me um, whilst I was preparing for tonight. And then that will lead me to the scripture that I want to read. The Holy Spirit said to me, I started by saying that um, God intends for our lives as the Holy Spirit makes it godly to become a kind of life that when men come in, come in contact with our life, it is as though they have met God. And Parudima Adenama Kosaila and the strength, let me tell you the strength of this life. Okay? Maybe this will make you desire the life. You see, if have you heard about something called poison? Have you heard about poison? You see, poison, if you hear poison, what comes to your mind? Death, isn't it? Death, that's what comes to your mind, poison. Because poison was created, it's in its making. In its making, it was designed to take life. It was designed to kill. Okay? So when you hear the word poison, poison is designed to kill. So now, imagine that you want to take poison, okay? And this poison is a bitter poison. Okay, so it's a peel. This poison is a peel. And this peel is bitter to taste. Now, these are two different things. Because the poison could be sweet. The poison could be sour. The poison could be tasteless. But whatever, however it tastes, it, the fact remains the same that it is a poison. And poison was not designed to give people a foul taste, a bitter taste. It's, you see, this is not the purpose of poison. The purpose of a poison is to kill whoever takes it. Do you understand this? So, either the poison is sweet 
or bitter or sour or tasteless those are just secondary they, they are so secondary they are just they are just they are just my libra they are just entourage okay those are by the way the meat of the matter is that the poison was weaponized it was designed to kill so let's take a case study now let's say that you now take a bitter poison okay this poison is is, is poison and then it's bitter to taste now when you ingest the poison say you take a spoon of the poison or you, you take a drink of the poison now when you drink the poison the first thing that greets your mouth your taste board is the bitterness isn't it so the poison is bitter you go oh you you, you know you know you, you squeeze your face and you your face quickly expresses the fact that you are tasting something that is not delightful the poison is is is, is bitter but was that what the poison was sent to do to to bring discomfort to your taste board no the target of the poison is not your taste board your taste board is only reacting to how it has been set up to perceive things so its perception of this thing that you're tasting poison is that it's bitter but that is not where that that is not the target that is not the assignment. That is not the objective of the poison. The objective of the poison is to kill you so that you don't even have the ability to taste anything anymore. Do you understand this? It is to, it is to put you in a state where you can't even taste. You can't even know bitter from sweet, from sour, from tasteless. You don't know. That is the, that is the end to which the poison came. The end to which the poison came is to kill you. But the beginning of the experience of the poison is your tongue tells you, or your tongue sends a signal to your brain and says, this is, this is, ah, oh, this is you. This is you. Okay. Well, good for you. Or maybe you taste it and the poison is sweet. You say, wow, no, 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 no. This is yummy. Good for you. But you see, either your testimony is that it's sweet, or your testimony is that it's sour, or your testimony about the poison that is bitter, that is not why the poison came. The, just You just wait for two more minutes. And then you will now know that there is another testimony that is stronger. And it's the testimony of your belly and every organ in your body. When it begins to shut down on the strength of the injection of the poison, then there is a new testimony now that outweighs the fact that the poison came in and it was bitter or sweet or sour. So also, salt, because the scripture that I want to read now is about salt. It says, well, if, a, if salt loses its saltiness, it says, what will it be good for? So you see, there is salt and there is saltiness. So if you taste a food, so if I put a, a, a bowl of soup in front of you, or if I put a bowl of jollof rice in front of you, and I put a lot of salt, like I just empty a whole bowl of salt into the thing. Now, when I place the food in front of you, you may, your eyes may not immediately see salt. Because the nature of salt is that it dissolves, okay? So, the salt has dissolved into this plate of rice now, or plate of soup. So, when you look at the soup, you're seeing the soup, you can't see the salt. But you take a spoon. You take a spoon. So the salt is not, it, the salt doesn't immediately greet your eyes. But when you, but when you, but when you taste the, when you take a spoon of the food that I put in front of you, then you will testify of the presence of salt in it. Even though your eyes cannot see it, even though your eyes do not immediately see it, even though your brain does not immediately appreciate the presence of the salt, but your tongue, your body will not be able to deny the presence of the salt. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, either the salt is a, so you will now say, Oh, this food is salty. You spit it back out. And you say, This food is salty. Why? You, the, what does that mean? It means this food has been around that substance called salt. And the influence of the salt can be felt in the soup. So I am not chewing. You know, salt is, is granulated, isn't it? I'm not chewing granulated salt. I am sipping liquid soup. But in that liquid soup is a strong influence of salt. So much so that I cannot even, I cannot even continue to take the soup. I have to spit it back out. So even though I cannot physically see salt, I know that salt has found its way into this food. 
because my 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 body system responds and testifies to the presence of the salt. So also, a, 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 a man, a woman, a boy, and, and a girl that has experienced the life of God. When you step into in your family, if you get saved and you are in your family, if you get saved and you are at the workplace, if you get saved and you become part of a group, if you get saved and you are in the church, you get saved wherever you find yourself. The moment you get saved and you submit yourself to the making of the Holy Spirit and it makes out of you a godly person. And remember to be a godly person is to have this life, this expressive life, this tangible, unmistakable life, uncontainable, unreflameable life, a boundless, limitless life of God. Once you become a person made into a stature, where this life is dropping out on the inside of you, everything about you points to God. Do you understand this? Remember, I said to be godly is that everything around you must be traceable back to God. You must be so when you taste this soup, soup, you trace the influence of what you're tasting back to a substance that you know called salt. So the salt may not even be present here. So you may be served the food. Say I bring you lunch to work. So I made this lunch and I've put so much salt in it and I bring the, 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 the food to your workplace. Now in the vicinity, in the old building of your workplace, there may not be salt. But guess what? In this food, there is salt. So even if there is no salt in the building, the, if when you taste this food, you will taste the flavor of the food is traced back to this substance called salt. So also, if I make you tea, and I just empty a whole jar of sugar in the tea. So you will say it is too sugary, isn't it? There is an influence that has dominated the old, the old cup. So even though in this cup, say it's a cup of coffee. So in this cup is coffee, in this cup is milk. But this sugar that has been introduced has been introduced in a quantity so much so that you forget that it's supposed to be tea. You forget the fact that there's linton in this thing. You forget the fact that there's tea bag in this thing. You forget the fact that there is, there is, there is four spoons of strong coffee in this thing. All you can taste is sugar. All you can taste and all you can think about is, oh my God, sugar, 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 sugar. And even if there is no sugar in that whole building, you cannot deny the fact that that substance called sugar has found its way into this cup. And all you can think about, it has not dominated your thoughts. It has dominated your taste board. And let me tell you something, not just your tongue will testify. If you, if you become brave and you drink, buckles up, drink the whole cup of tea, even your intestine, even your spine will testify to the fact that you have ingested something in a quantity that is not normal for your body. So, if you take, a, if you take poison and the poison is bitter, that is only the force that meets the body. But when the real in, in intent of giving you the poison begins to kick in and your organs begin to shut down, then you realize that the poison was designed for much more than just being bitter or being sweet or being sour. In other words, it is not just good for people to just know that you are a Christian as a religion. It is not just good for people to just know that, oh, she goes to church. He loves church. She sings church songs. No. And some people have said this is good enough. So they would say, yeah, we're, we're just going to go do business anywhere. You know, we, we, we're Christian. God is not insecure. So he doesn't write it on the sky made by God. He doesn't write it in the sea made by God. So why should we just publicize the fact that we're Christians and we're godly people everywhere. No, 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 there's no need. We know that. We'll just go into the world and we, and we, we make disciples. Oh, 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 shut up. You're setting up yourself to self-destruct. Because the world that you're going into does not shy away from showing you that it is the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? The world that you're trying to mix with, the people you're going to, they don't shy. The one who is, who is gay does not, they, they, they're not shy to tell you that they're gay. The one who is the one who takes drugs does not shy, they take pride in it. The one who fornicates takes pride in the fact that he can get any girl he wants. Isn't that what you hear all over the music these days? 
talk about drugs, talk about how they have weapons, talk about if you mess with them, blah, 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 you get clapped, talk about how much drugs they, they, they deal with, talk about how much racks upon racks and, and money they have access to. The world is not shy to speak about its darkness. The world is not shy to brandish and to unveil the inheritance of darkness that they have. Why should you be shy? Why are you the one that is trying to pocket your inheritance of light and godliness? Who will light up a lamp and put it under a bush? I don't want to go ahead of myself. So let's, let's read scripture. Let's read scripture. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it lost, if it has lost its flavor? So separate these two things now. There is the salt and there is the flavor. And the Bible says, what good is the salt if it lost? So it is possible for salt, it is possible for flavor to be extracted out of salt. So that what was once salt, so that what makes it salty is the flavor. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Do you understand what I'm saying? It says, if the salt has lost its flavor, what will it be good for? So, let's establish two things now. In that thing you call salt, there are two things. There is the physical substance called salt. And there is the flavor in it that really, really makes it salt. In other words, when you remove that flavor, it is not even good to be admitted in the congregation of what is called, what is called salt. It is now a waste of space. It is not something worth trampling upon, throwing out into the streets to be trampled upon because it has no, it has no essence anymore. The reason why you are a Christian and nobody gives a toss, they don't care at your workplace, they don't care in your unbelieving family, they don't care in your unbelieving community or your believing neighborhood, they don't care at your workplace that you are a Christian, they don't give a toss at, at wherever you find yourself. The reason why men don't care is because you are not, you don't have the reality, you don't have the power to furnish the reality of the God that, that lives on the inside of you. So when you say, I belong to God, there is nothing to back it up, there is nothing to show, there is nothing feelable, tangible, touchable, there is nothing strong, compelling. If you wear a Tom Ford perfume, you don't need to announce to people. People will be asking you, what are you wearing? Just come close enough. People will be asking you, what are you wearing? Why? Because in the cologne is strong. So also, even when a woman wears a nice, strong perfume, you can smell her from afar. When she steps in the room, you know she's there. And anyone who knows, and, 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 and if, you, if you spray one million, Anyone who knows the scent of one million, once they smell you, once they once they smell you, they can trace that thing smelling to the bottle called one million. They can trace it back to the company that makes that bottle called one million. When people perceive you, they should be able to trace everything about you from your speaking to your your, your the setup of your mind to your wisdom to your temperament to your countenance, everything about you, your dressing, your appearance. The kind of things you involve with, the kind of conversations you engage in, the kind of conversations you don't have. People's everything about you should be able to be traceable to the fact that this person is a godly person. Do you understand this? So that if people must know God, they 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 know you. And so if God who wants to give me famous and revered in the earth, it will be on the strength of sons who have become really like him. The ones who have become godly. So, you are the salt in the earth. But what good is the salt if it has lost its flavor? So, you see, this flavor is the life that is furnished by the Spirit. So, what makes us sons of God? What makes us Christians? What makes us believers? Is that we have partaken of this strange Malibra akotokotosi. This, this, this life, this not so normal, this not common life has found its place in us and is giving expression to everything that we do. That it becomes unmistakable when people see you. You are not normal. You don't just fit into the fabric of what they are comfortable with. And it must not be mistakable. They must not trace it to, oh, maybe it's just nice. No, they've seen nice people. 
So people must not look at you and what they denote from your life is, oh, he's just a nice guy. No! They must say, no, 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 this guy is a spiritual, he's a spooky guy. Because nice, they've seen. He's a good guy, they've seen. He's a smart guy, they've seen. They must be able to trace you back to God. Just like if I spray Tom Ford perfume, black culture. If you know black you know black, if you know that perfume, once you once you come close to me, you can know that oh that's Tom Ford. That's Tom Ford. You won't you won't even mention my name. You start mentioning Tom Ford's name. Did you see that? If you know the logo of Gucci. And you see me wearing a, a t-shirt that looks nice, say from afar. You just see that this t-shirt is nice. Once you come close and you say, oh yeah, it's Gucci, it's Gucci. At that moment, you're not even mentioning my name. You're mentioning the name, you're mentioning Christian Dior. Even though Christian Dior is not in the room. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Because Christian Dior is actually a person, isn't it? He is a person. Christian Dior is a person. So if I put on a t-shirt, say this shirt I'm wearing is Christian Dior, and you like it, and you come close to look at it, you go, oh wow, yeah, it's clear. Wow, this is this is Christian Dior. Now, in this equation now, I'm not present. I'm the one wearing it. But all you can see is the glory of Christian Dior, is the beauty, is, is the quality of Christian Dior, and it's not common. So, me putting on that t-shirt brings the glory of Christian Dior into the room, even though the man, Christian Dior, is not present. When you become so godly, when your life becomes godly, you get into a place, your words, your countenance, your temperament, your smile, your, 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 your deeds, your deeds, everything about you points to a supernatural God that people have not seen is not physically in the room but all they can see is a physical you and all they can see from a physical you is a supernatural invisible God that was Jesus became the express image of the invisible God so that people who have served God all their lives but never seen the shape of form when they saw Jesus he Jesus told Peter, he says, hey, don't feel it. He says, how long do I have to be with you? How long do I have to be with you guys? Do you guys not know that when you see me, you have seen the Father. I came to furnish a physical representation, expression to this spiritual deity that your forefathers served. So if the inhabitants of the earth do not fear God, do not respect God, do not add attach any value or weight to the name of God. It is because there are not there are not there are not many people that have the godliness to show the essence of this God so that people can see that he is worth fearing, he is worth revering, he is worth serving. Meanwhile, this is why Jesus came. That you can have an abundant life, a kind of life that is compelling, that causes people to know the supernatural, invisible one who is the owner of that life that cannot be seen. But God chose that if men must see him, what they must see is you. <laughs> God chose, he decided that I am so great and powerful. I am a mysterious, terrible God and I cannot be seen. But yet I want men to see me. But I will not I will not show myself. I will I will I will I will make a certain kind of people and I will put myself into them and they will scent, they will shine, they will smell a certain kind of way, they will shine a certain kind of way, they will speak a certain kind of way, they will move a certain kind of way that when men experience them, they can say they have experienced God. God will no longer be just that invisible deity anymore when people know you, when you when you manifest the creation and eagerly expect the manifestation of the sons of God. This is the life that Jesus died for us to experience, the supernatural godly life. And the one who makes this life a reality is the Holy Spirit. So perhaps you do not know the Holy Spirit experientially, intimately, you can never, you could never give expression to this life. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? So you see, there is salt is no good. 
without a flavor that makes it salt. Salt is no good without a flavor that makes it salt. A Christian is no good. A believer is no good. A God worshiper is no good without the spirit, the life of God that makes him a believer. Without the life, the spirit of adoption. The Bible says we have been predestined to the adoption by the spirit of God. He is the spirit of adoption. It is by this spirit that we come to partake of the life of God. So that when men experience us, they experience God. Because the only life we have is the life of God. The problem is people are still managing two lives. They are saved, but they are still trying, they are still living their life. The Bible says if you cling on to your life, you will lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, you will find it. What you will find, the it that you will find is the life of God. The life that you were originally designed to live, to exhibit. But you will never find that life if you don't lose the one that you have known all your life. So the problem is people accept Jesus. But the, the consequence, what you mean when you say I accept Jesus is I accept a life. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. This way, Christ that you have entered where you put your faith in him, this way, where you navigate this way, the destination this way is taking you to his life. So accepting Christ is accepting a way of life. And before this way of life begins to have a dent on you, you must let go of the life that you have known. Because the reason why Jesus died is so that you can exchange that life, that dead life that you had, for a true life. But people, people are so good at multitasking. In fact, this world was designed to make you keep your life. And so therefore, it becomes impossible for you to exhibit, to live, and to bring men into the influence of the life of God. I'm speaking about godliness, life of a believer, like father like us. He says, if a salt loses its flavor, can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled on that food as worthless. I'm going to tell you what it means, but what that means. Let's go on. Now, this verse 13 and verse 14 is saying exactly the same thing. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Did you see this? You are the salt. You are the sorry. You are the light of the world, like a city. You see, so it shows you if you shine in the brightness, in the in the radiance of your brightness. If you shine in the brilliance of the kind of light that you should be, you should be like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Remember, I said the glory of this life is that it cannot be contained. It cannot be suppressed. It cannot be. It cannot be oppressed. It cannot be damaged. It cannot be limited. It is a limitless, dimensionless. You cannot constrain it. You cannot restrain it. You are the light of the world, and the pattern of this light, the way this light works, is it is like a city that is on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. No, so lighting a lamp and putting it under a basket is equivalent to a salt that has lost its saltiness, that has lost its flavor. So I said these two scriptures are the same. If you put on a light and you hide it under a table, it is equivalent to salt that has lost its flavor. What does that mean? It means it is a crime to become a Christian and people can know God through your life. It is a crime. And the Bible says, this salt that has lost its flavor, what is it good for? To be thrown out and to be trampled. The reason why you are being trampled every day, the reason why you are being oppressed, the reason why the government is oppressing you, your bills are oppressing you, your family is oppressing you, your friends are oppressing you, it looks like you are surrounded by oppression. The reason is because you have lost your saltiness. And so therefore, there is nothing to be desired of you. And it is as good as a light to you. The glory of the light is to light up the whole house so that everybody can see. And if you take that light that has such potential, 
and you hide it under a table where its light is contained and constrained. You see, this is not the life of God anymore because the life of God is that it will be like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. It is that you will be a light that is shining that cannot be covered. So when you shine light of a lamp and you put it under a bushel, under a, a, a table, under a basket, it is equivalent to a salt that has lost its flavor. Now what does it mean to light up a lamp and put it under a basket? It is to be saved, receive the Holy Ghost, and then you allow your flesh to cover the whole power that is inherent in your saved spirit and your spirit energized spirit. Do you understand this? It is to be a born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, tongue talking, and you are still living a carnal life. So because of your carnal life, people can never experience the power that is under your skin. Jesus said, you cannot put a new wine in an old wine skin. Why? Because the wine will burst the wine skin and the wine will waste. And you cannot use a, you cannot cut a, 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 a piece of an old garment to patch a new garment because the strength of the new garment will pull apart the old patching. If you get born again, give your life to Christ, share in the commonwealth of Zion. Become a part of all those that Jesus died and paid a ransom, a heavy price, to pull them out of the economy of darkness. And you receive the Holy Ghost. And all of it, all of this do not culminate in people seeing you and seeing God. People experiencing you and experiencing God. People coming to know this invisible, powerful, glorious God through encounter in your life. Then you are you are like a man who you are like a light that is hidden under a basket. Because you have denied the world the essence for which you were saved. The reason why Jesus saved you is so that you can live a kind of life that advertises, advertises his kingdom. It's so that through your life, people can know that there is some, something that is to be experienced, something to be known, something to be learned, something to be felt. Your life is supposed to instigate that men come out of where they are to come experience something new. Your life must be compelling. Pointing people that there is yet something that they are deficient in. If your life does not do that, you are like a, a, a little candle put on that and the table and the basket here is your carnality, is your flesh. Is the desires of your soul that clouds and shrouds and cover the glory of God that is in your spirit. Do you know that that same spirit that you received, my Libra Andos, that same spirit that you received was the same one that Apostle Paul received. That same spirit that you received, that same Holy Ghost that you received was the same one that Stephen received. He didn't receive a special or different kind of spirit. The same regeneration that took place in your spirit was what happened to all the apostles. The same Holy Ghost that you were filled with was the same one that Jesus was filled with. There was no customized Holy Ghost for Jesus. And the godly life that you were designed to live was the same one that Jesus lived. So if your life, if Jesus' life had that much influence in three years, and you have been born again for nine, ten years, and I'm speaking to myself, and this is what I, the Holy Spirit challenged me today. And so if I will not, if I will not accept littleness, if I will not accept a mundane life, it is because of the exposure that I've been given to this kind of light. If your neighborhood does not feel God, if your neighborhood does, if, if, you, if the young people in your environment or people around you, your place, wherever, wherever it is that you encounter people, if they don't see you and they feel like, ah, there is one more thing. If, if someone who has attained and achieved everything in this world does not meet you and they feel like, what do I have? I have nothing. If I don't have this thing that this person has, then everything I have counts for nothing. If you don't wield that kind of influence on people, then you are saltless. You've lost your flavor. You are like a lamp that is hidden on thy table. And to this end, Jesus came. No one lights up a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand 
where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way. Did you see this now? In the same way. In other words, I said this to say this. Okay? I said the foregoing to say this that I'm about to say now. Verse 16. The parable that Jesus has said about the light and the salt, the reason the end to which he said is that you may understand what he's about to say now in verse 16. So verse 16 says, In the same way, let your good deeds shine. So what shine, what equivalence to a candle lit up is that what you do, your actions, your doings, let it shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Not, not everyone will praise you. Not everybody will shout your name and hail you. No. Everyone will praise your heavenly father. So you see, I said a godly life is a life that points to God. A godly life is a life that when everything is factored in and considered about this person that possesses this life, all men can see is God. When you spray a Tom Ford cologne, when people smell you, all they can know and remember is, this is Tom Ford. When you wear a Christian Dior jumper, a Christian Dior t-shirt, when people see it, all they see is Christian Dior. When people experience your life, your deed was culminated into a knowledge of a God that people have never seen. Let your good deeds, and your good deeds here does not mean Oh, when you give. Because the Bible says that when you give, let your left hand not even know what your right hand is giving. So, it's not talking about just your generosity. Those, those things are good too. They are part of it. But it's not just talking about that. When it says good deeds here, it is the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, by a fruit, you come to know the tree. And God is only known by his own kind of fruit. Because there are different kinds of trees and different kinds of fruits. Isn't it? So God himself is a tree. And this tree of life can be known by the fruits of life. Do you understand this? So the deeds are the fruits. And so giving money is not a way by which God will be known because unbelievers can give money. So let's make something clear now. Whatever you can do that unbelievers can do too cannot be something that you can use to point to God. Because then it will mean that God is common. There are, there are certain things, there are certain realities that are only around, available around God. There are, all, there are certain realities that can only be furnished by the Spirit of God. Do you understand this? There are certain realities that could only be furnished by the Spirit of God. That even if you attempt to do, listen to me, there is a kind of giving. There is a kind of giving money. There is a kind of using money that can only be pointed to God. And there are certain kind of giving money that we can still see among men. In other words, it's not common. There's nothing special about it. So before you camp your life around that, thinking that is what you will use to display godliness, no, no. And the way you will know is when people see those things, they don't see, they don't see God. They still just see a nice guy. <laughs> Isn't it? When people see those things, when people see those things, the best they will see about you is they will just see another nice guy. Guess what? Because Bill Gates is doing the same thing. A lot of billionaires and rich people, philanthropists, they are doing the same thing. So you bringing out your own two cents to do charity does not really point to God. But there are some fruits of the Spirit that only comes from God's Spirit and because the world does not have this Spirit, they cannot brandish the same kind of results. This is what I'm talking about. This is what makes us salty. This is what makes us the light of the world. It is that the brightness, we don't The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, it says, The sun shall no longer be your light by day, neither will the moon give you light by night, for the Lord your God shall be your everlasting light. And the prophet began to prophesy, he says, God will be the light in this city. When you get to a place where you become a person, Whose light no longer comes from the sun by day. And the light no longer comes from the, from the moon by night. And when God has now become the brilliance and the radiance, arise and shine. For your light has come. Why will God become, begin to say your light has come? If the light that God is talking about is the same light that has been in the earth. No, no, no. This is a different kind of light. 
and God is calling us to arise and shine this different kind of light. There is what the world calls kindness and there is what is called kindness according to the definition of the fruit of the Spirit. There is what the world calls love and there is what we call love. Those of us who have been schooled in the school of wisdom. And when I was teaching about, um, there was a teaching I was teaching, I was teaching about righteousness and I was talking about the pillars of the kingdom and I was speaking about love and I began to chronicle to you how this love is different from the way the world and Jesus began to say, if you love, if you love, the way the world loves, he said there is no credit for it. Because unbelievers do the same. In other words, there is a kind of love that is common. And there is a kind of love that is only furnished by the Spirit of God. This is the kind of love that we are called into. There is a kind of life that is common. So, if you want to claim that you are a generous person, there are already generous people in the earth. Generous sinners. Unbelievers. Unbelievers. If you claim that you help people, you, you help people, there are already people who don't, know, who, don't, who don't have no ounce of spirituality and they, they don't find it difficult to help people. So those things could not be the things that point to God. There are certain treasures. There are certain characters. There are certain fruits that can only be furnished by the Spirit. These are the things that point to God. Remember, a godly life is a life that when men encounter it, the only thing that they can resolve to is to say, this is God. This can only be God. This is not. This is not human. Remember the kind of wisdom that was needed in Babylon. Then the, the astrologers and the diviners and the sorcerers said, "The person, this kind of, this kind of, this kind of wisdom is not found among men." They say, "King, no king has ever asked anybody this kind of question you're asking. This, the kind of wisdom needed to furnish the desires of the king." As such that are not found in the dwellings of men. So whoever brings this kind of wisdom, this person doesn't live among men. Guess what? Daniel, a mortal man, brought that light. He brought that salt. And he sprinkled that salt in Babylon. He shined that light in Babylon. So yes, there is a spirit in man, the inspiration of the Almighty, that gives them understanding. And so Daniel shined a light in Babylon. And then the kings, and can you not see that every time this light shines, the king of the earth will say, the Lord is God. The Lord of the Jews is God. Did you see this? They never said, Daniel is God. Or Daniel, Daniel, the man, my man, Daniel, my man. No, 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 no. The acts of this man who carry this kind of life culminates into the even seeing God and acknowledging him to be God. Nebuchadnezzar has acknowledged that the God of Daniel is God. And so did Belshazzar, so did Darius, so did Cyrus. They acknowledge that the God of the three Hebrew men, this God is God. Why? By the deeds of this man. Was the deed of Daniel generosity? Was his deed niceness and kindness? No. They are spiritual fruits. He did things that, that nobody else in the earth could furnish. He brought a wisdom that was not common among men. These are the deeds that scripture is talking about. Because when you say, let your good deeds here, you will never be that to ask, you know, be kind, help people. Give give money to people, help the poor. Da, 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 da. You quickly you quickly assume that you understand what I was saying. No no no. The good deeds here are things that are actions. The things that comes from you that came on the account of the spirit of God being domiciled on the inside of you. There are acts that were furnished through the corridors of your of your of your humanity that causes men to know. That there is something straight that resides in this person. And he draws men. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. The reason why people are not being drawn to God is because people are not lifting God up. And what lifts God up are acts that causes, that compels men, people to know that there is one more thing to learn. I haven't learned everything, there is still something to learn. I haven't known all things, there is still something to know. I haven't experienced all things, there is still something to experience. Whew. In the same way, let your good deeds shine. Your good deeds is, is the flavor. Let your flavor move through this door, this plate. Let your light shine. 
for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father and if you read in the book of Ephesians you will see that in all that God designed to do in his mysterious plan which is Christ what God set out to get for himself is two things praise and glory two things praise and glory and the way he does it is when his glory is revealed it results into praise when the glory of God is revealed it results into praise The reason why people don't care about God is because not many people are revealing His glory. And so God is not getting praise out of men in the earth. But can I tell you something? The generation has emerged. God will get praise. We are the generation that will bring Him praise by the deeds furnished by the Spirit because we understand and we have now submitted. We have counted our life good for nothing but to apprehend the reason for which we are apprehended to know God and to live and to show his life to the world. I will have read more to you, but let's leave that. Let me show you one last scripture and then I'll pray for you. Let me show you I'll show you two scriptures actually. Quickly, quickly. Second Peter chapter 1 and here I won't talk much. I won't talk much. I'll just read and then, and then uh, uh, First Timothy chapter 6. This is where I want to pitch my this is where I want to end tonight. But second Peter chapter 1. Let me read from verse 3. It says, By his divine power, by his divine power, by his divine power, by his divine power, God has given us everything we live, we need for living a godly life. So this life that is expected of us on the back of having put, put, having put our faith in Christ Jesus, having received the Holy Ghost, then it, not, remember, remember the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2, it says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So the end to which the Holy Spirit comes is to power a kind of life. Did you see this? It is to supply power to live. A, if, because if the end to which Jesus came is for us to have a kind of life, God's kind of life, and to make that happen, Jesus died, okay? And then what his death did was that it qualified us, okay, to be declared righteous with God, and then to be given a spirit called the Holy Spirit. And remember the destination is still this life. Everything that we're doing is to arrive at a reality called life, abundant life. So Jesus died, he paid the price, okay? And then when you believe in that, you are made righteous. It means God is no longer angry with you. He doesn't want to kill you anymore. He doesn't want to destroy you anymore. He's at peace with you. But that's not the end, okay? That's only a beginning, okay? That's only a beginning. He's no longer angry at you anymore. He, doesn't, he no longer wants to destroy you anymore, anymore now. That's only a beginning, okay? So he, you are now given a spirit, okay? And the, the works of this spirit is what has been diminished and has been unappreciated and un, unembraced in the church. This is where I'm going. The job of this Holy Spirit is to, thou, you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Jesus there did nothing until he was baptized in the spirit, okay? And government came upon him and he went and he was tested of the devil and he returned in the power. It is after he returned in the power of this spirit that he went about doing good. Remember, doing good is to carry out certain deeds that points to God. He was only able to point to God after he had received the same power and he told his disciples, he says, don't think you're better than me. Don't go anywhere. I don't care how much you now know your calling. You don't know your calling. You don't know your, you don't know your prophetic calling. You don't know whatever it is you know. Don't attempt to start dispensing any duties in the corridors of what you know until you receive the same thing that I received that furnished the realities that I was able to express so that you guys know and see the Father. Don't go anywhere until you receive the Holy Ghost and you shall receive power. So the end to which you receive the Holy Spirit is to receive power. And this power is not handed out like donuts. It is not handed out like sweetie or handed out like, like a bottle of Coke. Okay, this life is you are made, you are made into Okokula Balinama. This life is, is, a, is a reality that you are exposed to. The Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. The reality of truth 
is a reality of power. The reality of truth is a reality of power because the reality of this world is that when you have cancer, you just take medication, you try to see if you can beat it. If you don't, then you're going to die. The reality of the kingdom of God is that we can lay our hands on the sick and they will recover from whatever disease. I don't care what the name is. When we live, it is a reality. This is a truth. And until, can every Christian lay hands on the sick? Um, so that should, any Christ, should every Christian be able to lay their hands on the sick? Yes. Can every Christian lay their hands on the sick? And they will recover? No. Because not every Christian. What, so what's the difference now? It is an exposure to a certain reality. Some Christians have been able to explore their spirituality and they are stumbled into a reality where that scripture to you is a scripture, to them is a reality. They walk actively in it. And they can put their life on the line to prove that it is true. Do you understand this? That bring a sick person. If I lay my hands and I call upon the name of Jesus, the sickness will leave them alone. And that is the boldness from which Peter said, look upon us. At the beautiful gate, he said, look upon us. Silver and gold I don't have because that is what you want. But there is something that I have. And I am so confident that I have it. That in the name of Jesus, I have an heritage. I have an heritage that if I mention the name of Jesus, I have been included in the economy of those who can call and get a response. And he called for a response of healing. And to show that Jesus, and Peter believed in what he was saying, he reached out his hand and he pulled, the guy was slowing the thing up. Peter reached out and pulled him up. And as he pulled him, his legs got strengthened. And he began to leap and jump. And so to Peter, to you, when you read that I am the God that healed thee, he sent his word and he healed thee. To you, it is still scripture. You see, to Peter, it is a reality. Okay? It is a reality that he can bet his life. So that when he is arrested and he is being flogged, he can look those his accusers and his those who arrest him and says, I can have no fear for you guys. I must preach the gospel because I have tasted, I have touched, I have experienced something beyond which I can doubt that Jesus is alive. And so because of the existence of Peter, Someone who has been plagued with a disease that normally leads to death, they receive a new verdict of life. They receive a new lease of life because of a man who has stumbled into his godliness. Do you know how many people will live and not die if you stumble into your godliness? Do you know how many people will be rich and not stay poor if you stumble into your godliness? Do you know how many people will truly live and not waste in this mediocre life if you stumble into your godliness. I'm reading the book of 2 Peter today because Peter stumbled into godliness. So I can read Peter. And there is still power in reading Peter today. 2,000 years, 2,000 something years after, there is still power in reading Peter today. This is the power that the Bible was talking about. In first, in first, second Peter chapter chapter one, verse three. By it is a divine power. So you see, what powers this life is power. Just like you plug your microwave to the socket, and then it begins to function like a microwave. Okay, it it heats up your food. Just like you plug your fridge, your refrigerator to the power source, and it begins to cool your food and cool whatever you put it inside of it. So also, we were designed to live a kind of life, and what as this life is the Holy Ghost. It is a divine power. And this is the power that Jesus said you will receive after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And how do you receive this power? The Holy Spirit begins to lead you. It takes you into a school. And this is a school of foundation realities. It takes the word that is spirit and life and it makes it into a reality. So that for you, there are no longer words. It is life. It is spirit. It is not just sound. It is just text. It is spirit and it is life. And on the, on the account of the brilliance of this light, you can give light to someone who is walking in darkness. And all of this results into people coming to know God. This is the mystery of godliness. God has given us everything, not some things, everything, but everything that God has given us to live a godly life is it, it comes from this divine power. It is this divine power that powers a godly life. By which men can come to know God and fear God and revere God. So if, if the world does not know God, if the world does not care about God, it means there are so few 
people that are that are being that their lives are being powered by this. So I don't know what people's lives are being. I don't know what pastors' lives and prophets' lives are being powered. But definitely not this because if they were powered by this life, the result and effect is that the world will know God. The world will experience God. Like Nebuchadnezzar, the strongest man in the earth, he acknowledged. Let me jump. Let me jump. Let me jump. Let me jump. Okay. Let me read verse 4. It says, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enabled us to share his divine nature. So the divine power of God powers a divine nature. Did you see this? It is by the divine power of God that we can... So he gives us these promises. These promises cannot be fulfilled except you tap into a certain level of spirituality. So the promise that God gave to Abraham that I will make you father of nations and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That kind of promise cannot be fulfilled except Abraham journeys with God to a place where he stumbles and he receives this power, this divine power. Because the reality in that promise can only be furnished by this divine power. And so when the reality is furnished, that the man who stands at the center of the reality has now partaken of God's nature. Do you understand that now? So there are certain occurrences that should be happening around your finance, around your business, in your workplace, in raising your kids, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your city. There are certain things that must happen around your life on the strength of you receiving the divine power of God that your life will be pointed to as an example of the one that shows the divine nature of God. We're called to live a divine life, not a mundane life. So don't tell me, don't tell me, uh, don't be spooky. No, you don't be don't be carnal. Don't tell me not to be spooky. I was called to live a life that is much more than what meets the eye. So don't regulate me. Don't don't neutralize me. Don't tell me to don't don't believe in miracles or, or, or miracles are just something things that happen once in a while. Believe in laws and principle. No, 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 no. That's what the world believes in. That's what the world operates on. The laws and the principle of God. The proof that you have obeyed it are supernatural occurrences, not the same results as the world. If they obey the law of God, God gives you the same result as the world. Then what's the point? That means you have an option. No, no, no. It must be different. And I'll show you that in scriptures. In fact, let me show you quickly. Let me show you the Matthew. Because I was sensing that there was something I was supposed to read in Matthew that I didn't read. Let me show you what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. Malibra Okay, Matthew chapter 5, the same chapter 5 that we read. Let me read verse 19 and 20, and then you see what I'm saying now. If you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. I don't want to talk about this because I would have shown you how John the Baptist didn't make it into the kingdom. Okay? This, this scripture answers it. Okay, but I will leave it to you to go read your Bible and let the Holy Spirit show you. That's not my contemplation tonight. Maybe another teaching. I'll go into it. But, and then, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing that, that verse now. It says, but anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, the key to greatness is obeying the law of God and teaching it. Obeying it and teaching it. Obeying it and teaching it. They will be called great. And look around the life of Jesus and tell me one thing that you saw that was normal. Then verse 20 is where I'm going now. Okay, now I'm going to jump back to first second, uh, first second Peter. Verse 20 says, but I warn you. See, it's a warning. So Jesus is not advising you here. He's warning you. And when Jesus says, I warn you, you better pay attention what, to what he's about to say. Jesus said, I warn you. Unless your righteousness is better, better, better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law, and the Pharisees, you will never, never, never enter the kingdom of heaven. So you see, Jesus made, he underlined the quality of righteousness here. Remember the religious teachers have been serving God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and they have created for themselves a kind of righteousness. The kind of righteousness that the, the young rich ruler had. When he came and he says, what must I do to follow you? And Jesus said, Obey all the laws. And he says, I've done it for my youth. And Jesus loved him. So that was a kind of righteousness he had. 
Okay? And Jesus acknowledged that righteousness because Jesus didn't condemn him or, or, or reprove him or begin to begin to call him out or anything. No, Jesus said, perfect, perfect, good, awesome stuff. So you, you have that righteousness, but that can only take you so far. It cannot cause you to cross into the kingdom that I came to advertise the citizenship of to the people. This one is a, a regime of the spirit. It is a word that the Holy Spirit can instruct you on your feet and you follow. So Jesus said, okay, you have obeyed the codes for the stone. Now let me give you a code from a spirit. The word, a quarter. He says, go and sell. You know, in the, in the law, there's no way it's written in the law that sell everything you have and give it to the poor. It's not written in the law. Jesus gave him a law of, his, of the spirit on his feet, having acknowledged that he has fulfilled the words on the stone. He said, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. He, he showed him the way into the kingdom, because following me, Jesus is leading people into the kingdom. So if you want to get into the kingdom, this is what you must do. It is a law that is produced by the Spirit on, on your feet. <laughs> and this law, by the way, has basis in the ten that he has been obeying. And Jesus gave him a new one, in this new region, powered by a divine nature. And the guy failed to enter. He failed to enter. And so Jesus says, unless your righteousness is greater than the one that people had, the best that was available under the law. Now, imagine the people that were not even under the law. So imagine the Gentiles who didn't have this law. Remember, they, this was how far from righteousness. So if what you do only puts you side by side with the people in the world and it's called good, then you're not good. That's what I was saying. You cannot taste the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is divine. So if the way you solve problem is the way that an old believer can equally solve problem that way, then there is nothing about that that gives glory to God. Because textbooks can still take glory for it. Inventions and innovations that came out of Harvard and Cambridge and Oxford can still take the glory for it. New things can still take the glory for it. But when you do things that defy the books and defy the knowledge of men and defy the wisdom of this world, that glory can only go to one source, God. Because it defies every source of glory that they know on the earth. In hearing is God glorified. If you don't do it this way, the Bible says, those who have appearance of godliness, they are denying the power thereof. There is a power that powers godliness. So any appearance of godliness that doesn't that doesn't that is not powered by this power, you are denying this power. And this is the power that Jesus died to give you to afford you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So let me jump forward now. So I read 2 Peter chapter 1. So I showed you how this life is powered. It is a spirit life, it is powered by the spirit. Because of time, I will not be able to read more. Okay? I will not be able to read more. There's more I want to read to you. But let me finish in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And this is where we'll finish. And this one I'm just going to read. Okay? I'm, I'm going to try not to talk too much. I'm just going to read. And this scripture... Anyways. I read. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, no, let me read from chapter 5. <laughs> Oh, Let me read from chapter 5 from verse 20. It says, Those who sin should be reprimanded in front of the whole church. So, Apostle Paul had sent a letter to his son, okay, to his protege. His name was Timothy. And this Timothy was a young man, okay, who has been saved, who has received the Holy Spirit, who has learned under the ministry of Apostle Paul, and he is now pastoring the church. So Apostle Paul was sent him, sending him a letter to teach him and to, and to give him stature on how to be a worthy servant of God and how to dispense the duties of a shepherd in a way that is commendable and is, and is, and is worthy of praise. So, I've said many things. Okay, telling him how to run the church, how to direct the church, how to conduct the affairs of the church. So, I'll just give you a background story. Okay, so verse 29 says, Those who sin should be reprimanded in front of the whole church. He's teaching them how to deal with people who sin. Okay, rebuke them in front of the whole church. Don't hide it. Let everybody see it. This will serve as a strong warning to others. 
I solemnly command you in the presence of God and Christ and the highest angels to obey the instruction without taking sides or showing favoritism to anyone. This is our support, changing his protege. Calling God and Christ into account and the mightiest angels to bear witness of this doctrine that he's given him. Verse 22 says, Never be in a hurry to appoint church leaders. In other words, never be in a hurry to appoint pastors. Be careful in ordination. Be extremely careful in ordination. Don't be quick. Let ordination, ordination is just not like rice and beans and, and sweetie and, 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 and donuts that is just handed out to people based on winning souls. No! 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 The apostles were not appointed based on winning souls. They were appointed on the strength of Jesus' overnight prayers that opened his ears to hear the ones that the Father has chosen. Not based on the works of the apostles. Not based on who is... Because remember, he called the apostles out of all his followers. Maybe there were even people that were more active physically. Because the Bible says there were people who were given to the ministry of Jesus. Joanna, the wife of Chusa. They were not called into apostleship. It's not on the account of what you have done. It is on the account of an election that has happened before the foundations of the earth. And the one who must call you, or the one who must identify the calling of God, must be the one who has the ears to hear the one who elects. So he was telling Timothy here, it's never been a hurry about appointing a church leader. Do not share in the sins of others. What does it mean? If you are quickly, if you are quick, to appoint church leaders, if they sin in the position of being a leader, you will share in their sin. That's what he's saying. And I've heard people say, yeah, uh, let their sin be upon me. That's not scriptural. You, you're sentencing yourself to death. If you appoint someone to be a leader in the church, who has not been appointed leader by God, who the obligation is not upon prayer, 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 strong prayer, and the Holy Spirit said, Select unto me, separate unto me this one and this one and this one. If ordination is out of that, out of that way, you will share in the sins of others. It means anything they do in occupying that position, any sin they commit that is from the efficiency of in stature, and they commit that sin in, in, in the position of advantage, in the position of being a leader in the church, you will partake of the punishment of that sin even though you are not the one that committed it. Because you are the one that committed it. By appointing a someone who is not of stature into a position that must be occupied by someone of stature. It's like putting a plumber as a prime minister and then he begins to mess up the country. Whoever voted the, that plumber in, they are the ones that are responsible for the damage in the society. Verse 23. Don't drink only water. Okay, so let me fast forward now. So, Avon... I will say all of these doctrines. Okay, we now arrive at chapter 6. So follow me now. All slaves should show full respect to their masters so they will, be, so they will, not, be, uh, they will not bring shame on the name of the Lord and his teaching. If a master is a believer, this is not an excuse for being disrespectful. Those slaves should also work even harder because their efforts are helping other believers who are well loved. Then, verse no, continuation, continuation. Then Apostle Paul says, teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the awesome, the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Did you see this? On the strength of the Spirit, the stature of the Apostle Paul now sustains because he has lived and he has been governed and he has been tutored in the school of the Spirit. He was able to give this sound doctrine to a young protege and says, teach these things, do these things because these things, they promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Remember, if you stop at knowledge and you lack understanding, you will, you, will, you will talk arrogant talks. And people will be misled because you are, you are talking, you are regurgitating knowledge. So they're like, ah, there's Christ in what you just said now. There's God in what you just said now. But the man who is speaking to you about God and Christ, he lacks understanding because he has not committed his life to following and obeying what he is attempting to teach. 
such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. This stirring up argument ending in jealousy, division, slander, evil suspicions, backs. No, no, evil suspicion, verse 5. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt. They have turned their backs on the truth. To them, the sh- to them, listen now, listen now, listen now. To them, the people who do not follow these things, to them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. I don't want to do that, but it, it, it needs no caption, okay? It needs no caption. Verse 6, yet, 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 this is what I'm going now, yet, true godliness with contentment it's, is itself great wealth. So what is wealth? Godliness! This is this is a revelation. Let this if you don't if you didn't hear anything I said tonight, please hear this. Hear the fact that there is a kind of life that Jesus wants you to live, and to that to that end, you are given the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit gives something called a divine power, and this divine power furnishes a reality of a new life that is different from what is known in this world. And it is through this life that men can come to know God and God can be glorified and praised in the earth. And whoever does not pay put premium on this kind of life, they are arrogant and their life leads to all manner of um, um, division and slander and envy and and suspicious uh, uh, life and and they turn their backs on the truth and to them, godliness is just a way to become wealthy. So every day, they will will, will use wealth according to this world as a litmus test to prove godliness. So if you're making money, that means that your Christianity is right. In other words, that's what it means. If you're making making money or having money or having wealth is the litmus test of your godliness. That's this is what they say. But that's not correct. That's actually people who have turned their back on the truth. Because the Bible says, yet godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Remember when God created Adam in the garden, God never started talking to him about the use of gold and what gold is for and, and all of those. The people who first defined the use of gold were from the civilization of Cain. So the understanding of money was perverted right from the beginning. We never got an opportunity to know what God, why God put that gold in that in our villa. We don't know. Because the ones who were supposed to be taught, they fell. So they never had God's opinion about what gold is for. And the man that we first saw Used gold and made gold plentiful, like stones in the land, was a man called Solomon. And where did the gold and the abundance of Solomon come from? Did it come from work and hard work? No, it came from godliness. He he was a student of the school of wisdom. And so therefore, he did things in a manner that the kings of this world could not do. So they all came to sit on his feet and they brought everything that they have labored, all the gold they've gathered. They brought it and laid it at the feet of Solomon to hear something that is divine, powered by a divine power, a wisdom powered by the divine. Oh, that was an A, and, 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 and Solomon was wiser than any man this time, wiser than Ezra, wiser than any man. And what powers this is wisdom was a divine power. And then so all the kings of the earth they brought their wealth and they submitted it at the feet of Solomon, the man who possesses. This divine power, godliness. And so Solomon modeled the mountain of the Lord's house, being exalted above every other mountain, and all the nations flocked to it. A godly man. He, he, so when the Queen of Sheba came, he says, Blessed be your God. Hey, she acknowledged Solomon didn't preach God to the Queen of Sheba. She was the one that he, she exclaimed that your God must really love you to have put you king over his people. The nations of the earth acknowledge God without God being preached to them, just looking at the glory, just looking at Solomon, his servants, his table, his cup, his clothes, his throne, his house. Everything was screaming, God, 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 God. This is a godly man. And the Bible says, verse 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Yet true godliness. Not what the world has called godliness. The true one. The true one. The one that is powered by a divine power. Godliness with contentment 
itself is great. It's, it's great wealth. Why, did, why was contentment put here? Because as the Holy Spirit is taking you on this school, things are revealed and given to you in quantities and in faces. So in every level, you must be contented. Don't outshoot your arm. Calm down. Let the Spirit take you. Follow the process and the progression. So contentment is needed. If not, you will jump out. You will quickly sum up. That the reason why we have the Holy Ghost is to wait in the business place. The reason why we have the Holy Spirit is to take the mountains. You will jump out and you will self-destruct. Godliness with contentment. So as you're growing in your spirituality, as you're growing in the school of the Spirit, when He's making you like God, you, 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 ad, you, ad, you administer godliness. This is great wealth. Godliness, a life powered by divine power, a nature powered by divine power that reveals God. This is godliness. This, this with contentment is great wealth. <laughs> and what it says in verse 7, it says, After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world and we contain nothing with us when we leave it. So, if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. End of story. I'm not reading anything. Well, the, the Bible says that if you have enough food <laughs> and you're not naked, you have clothes to wear, it says, it says, it says that's enough. That's enough. Now, am I saying, oh, being poor is good? No, being poor does not, it does not glorify God. But I'm saying the pathway to it is the power to get wealth is the power not to try to get wealth. Did you see this? The power to get wealth is the power to chase godliness. And then the wealth will be added the kings of the world will come to the brightness of your eyes and there is a light that will be lit on your head that will that will be the antidote to the darkness that the world is dying in and they will come for your lights and they will bring all the gold that everybody is dying and slaving to get they will bring it just to partake of a nature that is peculiar only to God's people this is true wealth and this is the life of a believer that we must be holy as our father never is holy and godliness with contentment, this is great gain. This is true wealth. So I want to pray for you tonight in the name of Jesus that the Lord increases the fruit of your godliness and the Holy Spirit begin to take you on a journey where it begins to lead and guide you into the realities of God. That you will come to a place where you will now identify that your greatest need is the divine power of the spirit not gold not silver not houses not money your greatest need is the divine power of the holy spirit that furnishes a godly life and to this end jesus died and so perhaps you don't know jesus i'm calling you to know him tonight if you can say lord jesus forgive my sins i repent of all my sins I, I choose today to change my ways, to follow in your way. And I know that I don't know how to live your life. So give me your Holy Spirit and I will follow. Whatever he tells me to do, I will do. And I will make my, my, the chief of my achievement in this life. It is to submit myself to be made by the Holy Spirit into a godly man. A man whose life gives God glory and brings praise to God. And so those of you who are not yet filled with the Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And those of you who have been filled with the Holy Spirit but are hiding your lights under a table, I bring you out from under that table tonight in the name of Jesus. And I set you upon a lampstand that you may give light to your community, give light to your family, give light to your nation, give light to your continent in the name of Jesus. And that you will begin to treasure godliness. That you will begin to treasure godliness. That you will not live to satisfy the desires of your soul. That you will subscribe to the desires, to fulfilling the desires of your spirit. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And as you continue to, as you begin to do this, nothing will be denied you. You will lack nothing for God created and gave us all things to enjoy. Wealth will follow you. Prosperity will follow you. Increase, promotion. In the name of Jesus, help, sound, help in a sound mind. In the name of Jesus, you will be great in the earth. 
But you will not be great for just anything. You will be great as one who modeled the life of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Apostle Victor Ida, it is my name, and this is Life Spring Assembly. Um, I hope you've been blessed tonight. I hope you've been blessed. And I and I I would see you again on Sunday. Um, and I believe by then we would have another mighty revelation um, from the Lord to share with his church, even as we equip ourselves for the work of ministry. In the name of Jesus. I love you and God bless you. I'll see you on Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. God bless you.